I'm going to start recording because I got I got Wes Jackson on this morning. I know he's got a 1230 appointment. So what I want to talk about, I want to get that done first. Um, I'm not trying to cut you off, Mom, because I am so excited about uh, <laughs> about this trip. And I know a bunch of us are. So, uh, yeah, but I will here. I'll just this is our quick agenda. Um, for this morning, as I said, Wes, I've got Wes on the call because I want to talk about a few things that have come up this week that as we as we're going through a market where it's changing, we're starting to see people lose a lot of money um, in the scenario month to month to month. Uh, there's going to be targets on agents backs and we need to make sure and just clarify how important paperwork is and when we are subject to contract law of course we have to abide in, in within those boundaries so um th those are a few things i, I want to want to get wesley's two cents on uh as well and then um there was an economic update in branton it's a massive file i'm going to email it to everybody afterwards but a lot of great information for agents uh to review over a glass of wine in st john's newfoundland <laughs> and of course, um, you know, halfway through the call, I want to jump into uh, and announce the manager of Orangeville. So we're really excited about that. <laughs> There's a few other little things there. But um, as, as everybody is aware, uh, Joanne, uh, a.k.a. Tanya Chinchilli, is in Newfoundland right now. And it's a beautiful day. What, how, what's the temperature there, Mom? It's 17. 17 degrees. That is summer in yes. Newfoundland. That's as good as it gets, Bob. <laughs> That's it. But I actually have, um, when I was in Newfoundland a couple of years ago, I was at my brother's cottage. And this is, he was just kind of finishing it up here. But this is September 25th, 2019. That was a really nice day. And I think it was probably 14, 15 degrees. <laughs> and, and then that was the rest of the weather. I mean, you're wearing your winter jacket, your toque. It is cold there. And then you can see in this picture, I've got two shirts on, a sweater, and a big Carnegie wool thing, and then my shell, which so it gets cold there, but never cold enough to go for a dip in the in the ocean. So, <laughs> for those of you who are brave enough, come and join me. At, uh, where, where is it? Middle Cove Beach. Middle Cove Beach. We'll go there for a dip. Yes. But that's how windy it is. Look, that's Malik standing on a rock there, and the wind is just picking him up. <laughs> yeah that's how it was <laughs> that's it um so hey i got again i got wes here so i just want to go through one of the things i saw three times uh this just it's only wednesday i've already seen it over the weekend and into this week which is uh you may have scenarios where an agreement of purchase and sale either by the it goes past an irrevocable time to accept or um, you've got uh, a condition like in scenario two there where you've got a condition, whether it be five days uh, for inspection or finance, um, or this one's for environmental, but whatever that period of, of time is, it goes past that without an agent doing an amendment and that deal then is technically dead. So three times this happened in the last week with agents and, and this was something I wanted to bring up there. Uh, is input that you can actually uh, do an amendment where you're basically reviving that offer once you've gone past that that um, that contract of five days on the sixth day. Hey, you know what? I think there's a there's a clause I can put in here where, whereby we, we just get it going again, right? And so that's why I wanted uh, I got Wes on the call here just to kind of give his two cents. Um, I, the answer that I gave, I'm going to hold off to make sure I do it right. No, I know I do. Um, no, I'll give you. Here's so if, it, if an agreement of purchase and sale goes past that expiration uh, scenario, like in scenario two, five days, and this is common right now because it's, people are putting five days for finance, and it's going right up until the the, the last minute, and boom, they don't get that. Um, they don't get that. Let me just mute that person there. They don't get that. Uh, uh, I guess finance approval, and, and then you haven't you don't have enough time to do your amendment. No problem. I'll just do an amendment there and and change the uh, the time from five days to six days or eight days, whatever it is. I don't like doing that. 
Um, in a scenario like that, what I am suggesting is that you can um, do a new agreement of purchase and sale. And then in your schedule A, then put in a reference to directing the deposit from the previous offer um, that was accepted conditional and then direct it through mutual release, um, directing the funds to the, to the new uh, agreement of purchase and sale dated on that day. That would be my recommendation. Uh, Wes, I got you on the call. What, where do you weigh in on this as a lawyer? You're the authority. What, what do you recommend agents best practices to be doing in that sort of scenario? No, you, you've hit the nail on the head. New agreement, um, because legally speaking, you can't amend an agreement that is null and void. Right. And now, having said that, big asterisks. Okay, there, there are two types of judges in the courts. There are what we call black letter law judges, and there's a sort of more modern uh, intention of the parties judges. And so if you, if you look at the principle, you know, the, the primacy of the intention of the contracting parties. So if you have an agreement that says August 15th, after which it's null and void, and on August 16th, you signed an amendment that says and you get as flowery as you like with the language, this is just an abbreviated version, but notwithstanding paragraph one, which states August 15th, otherwise null and void, the parties you know, intend to proceed with this transaction as though the transaction is not null and void. And you can already see I'm doing more work than just spitting out a new APS, right? Like you see where I'm going with this? Yeah, sure. You can draft around the problem and hope that you get the modern judge. And the modern judge will give efficacy to the intention of the parties. You get a black letter law judge who says, no, you, you can't amend a, a void agreement. I mean, that's just a, it's a logical nullity. It doesn't work. And you've invested a lot of time and money into something that you can't enforce. And th this is where the rubber hits the road. If the deal closes and everyone takes their money and you transfer title, no one cares if there were problems in the paperwork. The reason why you need paperwork is because sometimes a train falls off the tracks, the deal doesn't close, and now there's a lawsuit, mm -hmm. and you want to get paid, and the seller wants their money, and the buyer wants title, or maybe they don't. You know, As we see in this current market, there's a lot of buyers who don't want title. They want out of the agreement, and they're going to be hunting for any plausible reason to put a litigation lawyer between you and the, you and the money. You know, a, a good litigation lawyer's retainer is fifteen thousand dollars. So, you know, if if you want to create a situation where your client is gambling on getting the right judge, by all means. But what I, I say to people in every context, where it's real estate litigation, whether it's co-ownership agreements, whether it's partnership agreements, shareholder agreements, while everybody gets along is when you want to do things right, and that's when you want to document things. So. If you've missed a deadline, reprint the agreement of purchase and sale with the updated dates. Everybody's happy. And yeah, you just, you, you, you pop into Schedule A, you say the deposit that was paid will be transferred and applied to this agreement of purchase and sale. You can go the extra step of, of calling the expired agreement Schedule C. So right on page one where you say schedules blank form part of this agreement. You can put C right there and then just in Schedule A, attached to Schedule C is the expired agreement, which is incorporated by reference. You, you know, that, that, that takes a lot less drafting than trying to come up with a clause to revive a dead agreement. Yeah. Now, there are situations where you pretty much have to revive a dead agreement because otherwise, you know, you, you've got a party who's trying to now maneuver on changing the price, changing the conditions and you really want to hold them, um, that is sort of next level complexity and is very fact specific. Uh, so I won't try to opine on that in a, in a general comment. Um, okay. But, you know, 99.5% of the time, it's spit out a new agreement while everybody's happy to sign a new agreement, solves all problems, you have no questions, um, and uh, your commission is safe. Yeah. I think in scenarios, you know, months ago, uh, not that we had to 
chase down signatures or initials, but even as a as a seller or a listing agent, you know, go ahead. You you've got the you've got the winning offer. You've got the winning price. Obviously, I want that. To, but my vigor to get them to sign off in time uh, was not as as intense as it is right now. Right now, to get a transaction complete, it is very intense. And I just I bring this up only to say to people. You know, even if you're one minute late technically on that irrevocable and you're initially in that irrevocable one minute late, and, and Wesley, uh, hopefully you agree, that deal is dead. <clears throat> it is not valid anymore. Um, I did have a scenario, Wes, which I wanted to get your question on. There's two buyers on an, on an offer, and see in this scenario here, 1059, one, one, one of the buyers signed at 1057, the other signed at 11.03 um, and the agent called me on Monday for that specific question. And I said, if the two buyers, the names on that contract, those are the two entities purchasing it and one went past that time. It's, it's not a valid contract. You need to redo the agreement of purchase and sale. And I know I'm being a stickler, but uh, I think these, these are the days that we have to be sticklers on these contracts. Yeah, a hundred percent. and. One of the questions that should be part of your, your standard roll off the tongue questions, when you're talking to the listing agent, because you're, you're typing up your offer, is, you know, any foreseeable issues with getting this signed? Oh, yeah, my guy's out of town till Saturday. Okay, my irrevocable is going to be after that. Um, it, it, it only takes a second to ask that question. Yeah. Now there's there's strategic things going to that like is it a bully offer is it this is it that you know may, maybe you're not so accommodating, but there's absolutely no point putting an irrevocable date where the seller you know they're up at the cottage this weekend with no internet access there's absolutely no chance they can accept the offer you're just wasting your own time yeah. and you know inviting people to you know dislike you potentially you know try and make it a professional conduct issue, you know, because I've sub I've now submitted an offer to you, Trevor, you're the listing agent. I've now shown my cards, but I've done it in a way that you can't possibly accept it. But I don't know what you're doing with that paperwork. Now, if you're shopping that around other agents to try and drum up better offers from them sure. in a scenario where I know I'm going to have to restart the process anyway, you know, you know, why even go down that road at all? I mean, it just takes two seconds. Any, any, anything I need to know about my irrevocable date? Yeah. And just the conversations that. you're having, you're having one conversation about negotiation, applying pressure, and we get that. Um, and, but for, for purposes of black and white here, if it goes past those times, we are, we are operating the boundaries of contract law. And, and you're right, Wes, like, you know, it depends on, I guess, the judge you get in any sort of case. Uh, when you when you go to court, but um, it's better safe than sorry. That's this is kind of where we're. If you ask us, how do we how do we do that? If it's gone past that time and you haven't done that amendment and the deal is now dead, the deal is dead. It's null and void. We need to do a new agreement of purchase and sales, um, either through the irrevocable time going past that or through conditions passing their oh, audit time. Um, the, the only thing I, I put in here, this is, I would do the exact same agreement of purchase and sale, but I would put in a phrase like this, stating that the buyer and the seller both agree to transfer that deposit um, of the original agreement of purchase and sale dated on whatever date of the amount of money. Um, and they're going to do this by way of mutual release. So on a mutual release, they both agree they're going to sign to the direction of that. Wes, yes, please comment. Can you go back to the last slides? I have another comment about how you're drafting Schedule A. Okay. In terms of best practices, where you are saying conditional on X, whether it's financing, inspection, whatever, and you say, you know, in the absence of this condition being fulfilled, uh, this offer shall be null and void. It's so simple to say, at the option of the buyer, this agreement shall be null and void. Yeah, yeah. So when the time comes, you're at the end of the 10 business days, the buyer then gets to choose. Well, this condition isn't fulfilled, so I will send you a notice that it's null and void. Or I can say, no, I exercise the option to continue 
because I, I've spoken to, you know, in your example, I've spoken to the environmental assessment guy. He gave me the verbal thumbs up. He's just preparing the written report. I know what I need to know to proceed. So you by saying at the option of the buyer, you you give the buyer that and the seller that opportunity to sort of go in and, and draft a quick amendment to extend that time in a way that's not going to automatically render the thing null and void. So just, just a little tweak of the wording yep. opens up the options for you. S like section that. one, you can't change those words, but schedule A clauses, you absolutely can. Yeah, love it. Um, and so again, once you get that agreement, for that new agreement purchase and sale, just kind of walking through the flow here. Okay, I've written the new agreement purchase and sale. I put a little phrase in there, the mutual release. Um, we're going to, we're gonna, both buyer and seller agree. We're going to sign that afterwards, directing the deposit from this date to the one dated and accepted on this date. And then of course that agreement, that mutual release might look something like this. You've got your mutual release with all your details instead of payable to a person. Obviously it's not payable to a person. We're taking that deposit from this offer that was accepted and we're holding in trust. And we're moving it over to this new agreement dated on this new date. And, and that will be the direction for um, those for that deposit there. Now, whether the wording here, Wes, if there's something there you don't like, you don't, you know, Trevor, I would tweak it a little bit more like this, by all means, weigh in, but. Oh, the only, the only tweak, just say, you know, presuming Century 21, you say payable to Century 21, comma, and then exactly what you have there. Okay. But you know that that's just for sake of clarity. It's not fatal without it. Yeah. But yeah, that, that's sort of the best practice. Yeah. And I only bring this up. This this happened again three times in the last week uh, with agents, and most of it pertaining to the financing uh, not coming through. That is one thing that's tripping people up. Um, so I just want, and, and of course you avoid all this by doing an amendment, being on top of, of the deal. Uh, so you can do that ahead of time, but that's something I, de I definitely just wanted to bring up. One thing, both Shazad and I was chatting with Tony yesterday. <clears throat> the, again, let's plan ahead of time and anticipate we're gonna have a, a challenge or, or a discrepancy. Be clear, like business day versus regular day versus if we, say a, a time and a date here this is important and you can actually avoid a lot of conflicts i know um margaret and i were chatting this morning on a deal she had and there was discrepancy from our agent with the other agent of like three days uh, which again how people count and when they start counting that uh can be a little bit tricky wes i'm sure you've come across this um no our 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 date started at this time on this day. Um, what's business day? Is it end of business day? What's the end of business day? Five o'clock, six o'clock, 11.59? What, what are your experiences with uh, defining the date and time for business day versus day? The, the very best clause is one which uses all three of those in the same paragraph. Cool. You'll have three days. And if it doesn't happen at the end of the fourth business day, that as of this date, and you're just like, what did the parties agree to? You know, um, I I default to date and time. Yeah. Oh, right. You know, it it, it just there, there's no ambiguity when you say September 21st at 8 p.m. Yeah. Ambiguity is uh, the tool of the devil. Granted, um, you know, you know, just. A, especially when you're drafting on the fly, you know, you, you don't hold people to perfection. It's just, it's more, you've received an offer and you're reviewing it. And, you know, it's worded with days and business days. That's, that's when you're not so much in control of how it's drafted and you don't necessarily want to do a whole sign back over it. Um, but, you know, often it, it is best to just say, you sent me an offer that says five days I don't like that. Let's just say if as of September 21st at 8 p.m., then boom. Yeah. Um, I like that. And Margaret, just you, you had a, a good phrase there. If there's any discrepancy from the time of acceptance of that conditional offer 
in the gray zone of when that could be, hey, if you know there's going to be a problem, you had a great um, a recommendation there too. Well, what we did was we just um, did an amendment because our agent thought it was one date, the other agent felt it was another date, um, and we were still within the second date. So drafted an amendment okay. just to say that, um, the, you know, because of the, if our agent didn't give the paperwork to the other agent or convey the acceptance when it happened. So we just put, um, due to the delay in delivering the accepted agreement of purchase and sale, both parties agree that the uh, conditional time period will be 11.59 p.m. September 9th, and then they both signed it. Is that okay? Yeah. Are you asking me if it's okay? I'm asking Wes, would, would that be okay? Like yeah, yeah. Um, depending on how you write it, you know, the, the best, the best sentence ever is, whereas the parties agree there's an ambiguity, the ambiguity is resolved as follows. I mean, that's kind of the structure. Yep. Uh, because again, you're, you're looking for uh, how will a judge interpret this? And so any no judge is going to come along and say, well, I interpret a day this way, so I'm going to supersede the joint mutual intention of the parties. That was our idea. Yeah, yeah that, that's not how things work in, in front of a judge. You, you can't, Trevor and I, or, and you, are, you and I can't sign a contract that says Monday is Monday, no matter what. And then I can't show up in court and say, ah, your honor, but you know, Tuesday is Monday. No, you signed right here that Monday is Monday. The fifth day meant the fifth day. It meant this, 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 and this. Any ambiguity is now resolved exactly in that fashion. So always have that in mind. What is a judge going to do when they read this? And so, uh, the, you know, judges use a Latin phrase, uh, and I'll type it in the chat. It's called nunc pro tunc, which means we're doing now as we should have done in the first place. So this, you know, th this language is time traveling back. You know, you, you don't have to pepper your contracts with stuff. Judges don't expect that, but that, that's that's kind of the track that they'll view it on. Now, what my my comment at the beginning when you're talking about reviving dead deals, if you want to write a book, you can, or you can spit out a new agreement. Well, that's where something is, is null and void and, and no longer valid. But where, where you have something that's just simply an interpretation, ambiguity, you know, definition of a word, nothing is null and void based on that. So as long as everyone agrees that it's not null and void, everyone agrees that the definition is X, you're solid. Good. Excellent. Thanks, Wes. Um, moving along, and, and, I, and again, Wes, I'm just trying to be respectful of your time. It is 12.29. Um, just heads up, because you said 12.30, but I got one more scenario if you got time to stick around. Um, if not, it's all good, thank you. Um, we have, actually, was uh, Tony brought this up to me. Tony Dawson in the Orangeville office brought this up. Trevor, we gotta make sure mortgage verifications are being done right now. If you have a scenario, and you know, long story short, in this scenario, you got a client that purchased back in January, they bought that home for 1.8 million, and now they need to sell that because the, the variable rate has gone up and their mortgage rates and they have, have doubled and they just can't afford that property anymore. You do a CMA to go in to sell it and you're coming up with 1.4 as a $400,000 less value there. There are scenarios where they don't have enough money, frankly, to, to, to get out of that property and sell the commissions to the sales agent. So, in this scenario, it's really a reminder to everybody, um, make sure on this form, which is already and has always been included with our uh, listing packages, when you go to take on that listing, uh, right now listings can be a liability. You're investing money in, in you know, photography and staging, time, effort, marketing, and then you sell the property and there's no funds there for you. Um, <clears throat> This is a scenario I haven't seen it yet, but I anticipate will start to happen. Um, Wes, uh, are, have you seen this uh, happening within your kind of realm right now? Where at the end of it, guys, I can't even sell the property. There's no commissions for the for the agent, etc. Have you seen this, Wes? Um, luckily, no. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But it is it is one that I I I, I think you would agree. Yeah, we're going to start to see these soon enough. Um, where it's especially dangerous, 
is someone who, and we're giving everyone this advice, bridge, so you can close on your purchase. Uh, then your sale falls apart. You're now selling for less, but you've already bridged. You've already, you've intentionally sucked the equity out so that you don't get sued by your, your own seller. You know, three transactions in a row, you know, you're selling to buy. Um, but that really leaves the agent in a precarious situation. So what, what, what happens as a practical matter in litigation, if the deposit is adequate to cover the realtor's commission, the commissioner, the, the, the agents and the realtors, the brokers are entitled to keep it. No one really ever tries to claw it back. Okay. Um, because the, don't forget the, the irrevocable direction in the agreement of purchase and sale is for me to apply trust funds to pay out the commission before I give any money to my client. Well, if, I, if I've paid money out to all the mortgage companies and I'm left with zero in my trust account, there's no positive obligation for me to pay commissions. So your deposits need to be adequate to you know, pay for your time. Um, so just be very, very careful you know, that you're, especially, and, and you should be counseling your clients to bridge, but, but don't, don't let them bridge so much that no one else gets paid. You know, because the lawyer's not going to close the deal if he's not getting paid. The mortgage companies aren't going to discharge their mortgages unless they get paid. Why have you done all your work unless you're getting paid? So healthy, healthy deposits. And, and this is going to solve a couple problems for me. Remember when you're asking your clients, you're not asking, do you have any mortgages? You're asking, do you have any mortgages, lines of credit, or other forms of financing secured against the house? We have so many people like, I don't have a mortgage. I just have a $700,000 line of credit, which they're only telling us two days before closing and nobody knew, right? Because they're adamant on the phone. I don't have a mortgage. I don't have a mortgage. I don't have a mortgage. You do. You have a $700,000 or your furnace. You just bought your furnace. It's secured with a PPSA and a notice of security interest. You, you just had some renovations done. You didn't pay for it. There's a construction lien. doesn't matter. Mortgage line of credit or any other form of financing that might be secured against the house and you want proactively to get your clients to give you recent statements for those, and you got your Excel spreadsheet, I'm listing for a million, the line of credits, mortgages, and financing all adds up to how much is there actually equity there for me to get paid, the lawyer to get paid, and for the clients to buy something new. Don't just take them at face value when they say, ah, oh, no, I have no debts, I have no mortgages. Uh, you, you might find out that there's a shortfall. So, um, yeah, on the on the mortgage verifications for your for your buyers, for your sellers, everything. It just you, you got to have a, an Excel spreadsheet to do that quick, dirty math to make sure you're getting paid. Good, thanks, Wes. I appreciate. I, I got to jump on my other call. Okay, thanks, thanks so much. Wes. Pleasure, everybody. Okay, I look forward Take to an in-person meeting soon. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Wes. Okay, now that the lawyer's gone, we can kind of just talk plainly now. Okay, it's easy. <laughs> Um, this was another scenario. I just wanted to put this up. I, and this is really a kudos to our front desk uh, uh, agents that catch things like this. Anytime you guys are upset or a little bit like, hey, I don't know why the front desk requires this paperwork, that paperwork. It's not necessary. I don't need this initial. I don't need that initial. This was a scenario. This, this happened last week where instead of... You will Instead of the purchase price of that um, of that property being, um, I think it was like seven hundred eighty thousand dollars here, um, they put the the deposit of ten thousand dollars in the actual purchase price. Both agents on both sides read it, accepted it. Both buyer and seller accepted it at the end of it. Submitted to the front desk, looked at it, and went, "Oh my god!" The girls at the front, "Oh my gosh." Trevor, we have a problem. Houston, we have a problem. They caught it. The agent was quick enough to do an amendment on that. But paperwork is extremely important, guys. And, and we got to make sure um, that, you know, you, you get a, a comment back from one of the girls downstairs at the front desk. We're doing it for your benefit. We have targets on our backs right now. Absolutely. And it's going to get even worse out there. So... 
Um, okay, the ec economic update. I'm not going to go through this entire slide. Just bear with me here. Um, hey, Trevor. Yes, Greg. Trevor. Yes. Um, I just have a question before we leave that section. Um, and I can see that there's lots of things we can do to be more proactive to avoiding, you know, our backs against the wall and and uh, causing problems. But is there any way that some of these, there's been some good comments. Is there any way that our web forms, some of those clauses could incorporate some of these recommendations? Um, yeah. Or like, is it yeah, just yeah, kind of relied on, on, yeah, just be, otherwise, you know, there are a lot of people that that aren't here potentially and they're not writing these things down or learning. Yeah, I'm just going to make a if note there, Greg. I'm going to make a note yeah. on on a couple of the, the items that, that were discussed here. And then we'll take a look at that as a management team. Just like, yeah, actually, that would look great. I know the one that that, that Wes was referring to, to the sole discretion or sole option of the buyer. That's a great one, of course. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And we do have on our, our templates, we do have a lot of those as well. Now, there's some tweaks there um that definitely can be done I, I do like date and time but it's not going to apply in every scenario as well right. right but to your point yes we can do that okay. cool buddy Thanks. um i just want to show a couple of slides from bear with me this you can see guys this is a huge 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 um, documentation. There's really good stuff in here. Uh, one of the things just kind of goes through it. This was took place on in on Monday through the branch and real estate board, and there was the folks from the city kind of giving this presentation. No, city, no, city planner there, me. city manager, me. Me and um, and again, you can just see the number of sales. Um, you know how they were high back in in June of last year, and how they decreased, and then they went back up, and they're coming back down as well too, both on the number of sales and on the prices as well too. Commercial still going strong. Um, there were some really cool points, and Christina was there as well too. She's like Trevor, the amount of companies that are investing in Brampton right now. Of course, you've got Amazon. This is a new site that's being built at Kennedy, just south of, uh, or sorry, just north of Steeles here. Um, Maple Leaf Foods here. Again, I'm gonna give it to you guys so you have this information. When people are asking you about why Brampton, well, if big companies, <clears throat> excuse me, like this are coming into Brampton, there's there's good reason. Um, one, of the, one of the questions you do get is where's a great place to invest in? Uh, I think it was, I forget the agent name, great, great agent in Toronto was saying, look at where, the big boys are investing as far as companies. Look at where the cities, both municipal, um, you know, regional uh, and provincial and federal, where, where are the governments spending money on infrastructure? Uh, re, uh, Rogers Relocation, downtown Brampton. Um, again, there's so much information in here. I'm gonna send that to you guys so you can, you can review that. Back to my little presentation here. One thing that came up that I, I thought was really interesting. Oh, let me see here. So I can get this. this the province of Ontario. Sorry, guys. Give me a second here. This is this little video is speaking to um additional residential units in brampton so just have a listen are you guys able to hear the audio as it comes through yeah okay i'm gonna go on mute for a second the province of ontario mandates in addition to second units that we already see in cities across ontario the city of brampton is working to establish clear guidelines for these types of garden suites we are developing a made in Brampton approach based on public consultation and implementing best planning practices. Sometimes called coach houses or granny flats, garden suites are detached from the main residence with some cooking, sanitary, and sleeping areas. Additional residential units, or ARUs, were 
refer to both second units and the proposed parking suite. Second units are currently permitted if contained within the existing home. Garden suites can come in many different shapes and sizes. They are a small structure detached from the principal residence. In Brampton, the proposed size of a garden suite will be limited to 35 meters square or under 377 square feet for most residential lots or up to 80 square meters for 822 square feet for agricultural, agricultural and hamlet zones. An existing structure or like a detached garage may be converted to a garden suite. Subject to requirements, a garden suite may be permitted on a property with a second unit. Garden suites can only be located in the rear yard or side yard of a property. Access to the unit can be by rear laneway, pedestrian walkway, or shared driveway. Brampton's policies on garden suites will include minimum standards for setbacks and height. A garden suite can help increase the city's housing stock and provide safe and affordable options for caregivers, family members, and Brampton seniors. To learn more about additional residential units. <clears throat> Anyways, great documentations here. Um, Christina, I, I don't think when you were at that event, um, there had been any applications for these types of units um, as, as, a, as a garden suite, as the third um, residential unit on a property in Brampton. It just came into effect, I understand, in early a couple August. Of, yeah, August 10th. So no, there, there hasn't been many applications. Um, there hasn't been any. And it's the same process. It's almost, it's like a new build. Um, and there are a lot of, you know, there's there's red tape. There's all those hoops that you have to jump to when you're registering any additional rental units. Yeah, and you know, um, guys, we only bring this sort of content up today because it's it's something that people are talking about, uh, especially as affordability, home affordability, um, it, you know, is is becoming more and more. Um, the theme and the conversation, not just as far as a, a result from what's happening in the market, but also on the political landscape, you're going to hear a lot more of this um, on, on, the, on the federal level as well, too. So I think this was really valuable information to, to bring back to you guys. So um, thank you, Christina, for putting that. Oh, one other thing about these garden suites, if you do have clients that are looking in those hamlets or downtown downtown has some programs but especially in Brampton land survey is a 100 percent requirement so when you have your clauses you know that say if survey available just keep in mind that when your client may be interested in putting one of these additional rental units they're going to have to spend the few thousand dollars to go get the survey done if there isn't one uh, that's great um that's great um, in the document, guys, I'm gonna we're gonna send out to you. So I'll email it out. Um, I, I think it's like almost 100 pages. A lot of information about you know for sale signs where they can be placed, and you know open house signs and the fines that are going after that. Again, just be aware of it. We're gonna send it out to you. Unfortunately, this is just for Branton. Um, I don't have that information in Orangeville, but I'm sure we can put that together for the Orangeville um, folks up there. But this was just recently done in Brampton as an update. So uh, again, I just want to remind everybody this week, uh, pretty much who, if you're going to Newfoundland, you'll be heading out either Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. Um, I will be available uh, next week, but if there's going to be an asterisk, I shouldn't be recording this part. I might be intoxicated answering your questions. <laughs> so you take it with a grain of salt. Uh, I'm teasing, but no, we're still accessible, but the entire management team will be out in Newfoundland. So um, for those of you who are staying back and if there's a scenario where, where we might need you, um, we really appreciate it. Um, but I, I think we'll all be fairly accessible uh, for any questions. So, And remember the time difference of an hour and a half ahead in Newfoundland. <laughs> That's it. It's okay. We won't be sleeping anyway. So No. <laughs> I'm already halfway there, Joanne. Woohoo! Good for you, Perth. I watched your photos. You're having a nice trip down. <laughs> uh, so far, I'm. I just I'm on the ferry right now. I don't know if you guys can see this. Mm. I can't. 
Yeah, we can kind of see it there. I can see the background. Uh, okay, so let me just turn on. That's that's where I am. Wow. Wow. Oh, so what, what, fair, what ferry is that? What port are you at? We just got one uh, from St. John, and we are going to Digby from the Bay of Fundy. This is New Brunswick. Oh, wow. Good stuff. Good mm -hmm. stuff. Great way to see Canada. <laughs> yep, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. People are nice. Wonderful. Exciting part. Can't wait to see you, brother. See you soon. <laughs> see you in Newfoundland. <laughs> Uh, just a couple of dates. You saw October 4th, we're going to be doing a kickoff and then Cassandra Walker. This is for November 16th. We brought this up last week. We just want to remind everybody. Um, so big news. Everybody's been waiting for it. We got a, we're going to have a new manager in the, uh, in the Orangeville market. Um, I will say this with great excitement uh, for the person that we have coming on board. Um, before I, I announce that, um, you know, it was, I just want a reminder, it was 26 years ago, roughly, that uh, Mum opened up the first office uh, in Brampton. And uh, we have grown significantly since then, but we always since she opened up, she did have the vision that she wanted to see from Brampton going north, the migration um, is going to be taking place, not only just for primary residential, but for that secondary residential up in Wasaga Beach and Collingwood area, which I got to say, it's it's easy to go in hindsight and go, yeah, well, everybody knew that. Everybody, no, that's not true. <laughs> um, that that vision and and that um, and then how it rolled out is <clears throat> is a testament to 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 mom's uh, intelligence and foresight and and um, and just anyways, I'm I'm glad you got that one right uh, and. Orangeville was always one of those locations from the Wasega because we had the Brampton and then Wasega and then the North, but it's like, I'm missing that in between. Orangeville is a key, key city. And so again, it is from our agents and the market responding saying, hey, we need we need presence in this town, in this town of Orangeville. And, and, and okay, Mom Martin decided to take the, the leap, open up the first office in Orangeville. Um, and our first manager there, of course, was Linda Cameron, who just knocked it out of the park, uh, representing whoop, whoop, uh, Linda. really well. And, uh, and really, um, you know, we always talk as managers, our jobs are really to make an exceptional a agent. And, and Linda did an amazing job training, onboarding, uh, coaching experience people. She's done a, a wonderful job. And and then when it was time and for actually to Trevor, I, I just want to add something to that. Like there as a it's it, being the manager is certainly a challenging uh, career, but to open up a branch with a manager and like Linda had so many days where it was herself and herself and herself with her. Um, uh, but to take a, a, a brand new space and to build um, you know, I'm just so proud of all of the leadership that we've been able to enjoy as this company has grown. But that, you know, hats off to Land Linda for that uh, initial nurturing of that office. Sorry, go ahead, Trevor. <laughs> no, 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 I, I, and that's good. I mean, um, I, I, it sounds like we're really giving like thanks and pats on the back. This is not lip service to our managers. This mm -hmm. is a this is a very Difficult job. The new manager in this in this uh, environment now is going to be taking on some some really big shoes to fill, frankly. And it's not because you know, of course, Linda and Margaret are doing exceptional jobs, but it's what our people require uh, of their brokerages. So we are always um, we're always here to serve, and we're always here to to make sure we're supporting you. So. Obviously, once uh, Linda left a few years back, a couple years back, uh, Margaret came in. Um, I think she was supposed to be just a filler for like a couple months and then just ended up. She's so awesome at it. We loved her. We're like, you know what? Just stay. Just stay. <laughs> and uh, kicking and screaming. No, she wasn't kicking. She actually, Margaret is, is very comfortable doing this job in the leadership role and, and is a, a wealth of knowledge. And I know the Orangeville office has really uh, appreciated her, her wisdom, her experience, and, and frankly, her tone and how she, uh, she handles herself. So that being said, 
trying to find the right fit uh, for the new manager that will support our existing agents as well as obviously we, we grow just like in your business. You're growing your business all the time with new prospects. We do the same thing with agents as well too. So um, that person was, uh, uh, was chosen and I, I think we went through about three or four weeks I, we had a lot of applicants. I got to say, I was really impressed with the number of applicants, both inside with our brokerage and outside within the brokerage. Um, and, and, and I will say the respect that the other brokerages across Orangeville have for our agents, specifically in that office, is huge. We have wonderful brand in, you know, as a as a, as a casting net, it's called Century 21 Millennia, but it's made up of individual experiences with each one of our, our amazing agents in that office. So I was really happy to be doing those interviews and hearing those, those kudos and compliments uh, and all extremely sincere, no lip service there. Uh, but we got to decide on one, one person to, to take on this, this role. And uh, <clears throat> without further ado, everybody's like, come on, just tell us, who is it? Um, Theodora um, has been selected, and I think she's there with uh, Margaret. There she is! Yay! <laughs> Yay. Welcome, Theodora. Thank um, you. We are so excited that you are the the, the individual that will be taking that um, that leadership role in that office, and it is a key office for us. It is a it is a, a strategic location connecting both the city GTA and the Northern uh, operations for that migration and for that uh, secondary property option. So uh, this was a very important role. Um, as you can see, I've, I've kind of just done an, a bit of an overview of, of some of her highlights here, but Tia Dora is a licensed broker. Um, she recently just enrolled in uh, her master's for psychology, uh, which I thought was fascinating. One thing I've known about Teodora, and I've known her for many years now, is she's one of those one of those people without anybody motivating her to do that. She's always reading those books that I have on display as just like props. She's actually reading those. She'll come into my office like, "Hey, wait, you're not reading this stuff. I'm taking this one." And she'll she'll read, and she, she's always thirsty for that that personal development and growth. Um, and and her enrolling in the master's of psychology, I thought that was fascinating. Um, she has been a part of the, uh, the, the CASA team here in Brampton uh, for, for a few years, of course, and, and recently uh, has been doing uh, working independently um, for about a year there. But she joined us back in 2014, and, and I, I love to have, you know, the option to, to hire within, which I was kind of, Mom and I were always leaning towards, we want to hire within the company and show that progress, um, the desire to Obviously, bring someone from a different brokerage brings those that opportunity for recruiting. But um, our, we always looked at what's our priority. It is serving who we have, who's been loyal to us, who we've been supporting. It's that's the priority. Um, and so, again, having someone from within is 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 a great benefit to that. Um, they know us. They know our culture. They fit really well with, within our our company. And Teodora, of course. Uh, really fits well. She's always part of the, the programs of social and professional development uh, programs. What I really get excited about with, uh, with Teodora, and, and especially as we're coming through, even the, the, the part of my this, this meeting here was about legal, 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 legal. And, and one of the things people go to market for is like, what's right and wrong? What's right and wrong? How do I do this? How do I do that? Teodora's got her law degree. She's been working uh, within that uh, environment for almost nine years there. <clears throat> and and that was a huge, huge asset as well, too. So, um, Tigra, congratulations. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor, for the lovely introduction. I'm grateful, honored, and very excited that I have been chosen for this role. Um, I want to thank Joanne, Martin, Trevor, and Shazad for the trust encouragement and mentorship throughout these years. Um, I know I'm taking over from a great manager, Margaret, here with me. And before Linda, I know they have raised the bar high for in the real estate industry with the Orangeville office. 
Um, I shall continue to do the same and be a support for all these amazing agents and outstanding top performers uh, in this office. And I'm looking forward to meeting you all. I know a lot of you are getting ready for the conference, uh, but I'll be around and at the office from now on. So just please feel free to pop by. I'd love to meet everyone in person. And thank you again. Congratulations, Teodora. We're so happy and proud of you. And that's a wonderful, exceptional group of people in Orangeville that I know you're all going to enjoy working with one another. Good stuff. Excellent. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that was the climax of the meeting. Like, I, I'm like, oh, I, mean, I, I think I, I did a lot of interviewing over the last month. I'm tired of interviewing. Um, it, it was exhausting, but, um, you know, it's, it's such an important role. We wanted to get it right. And, um, and really, I, Theodora's, uh, uh, it takes time to get to know people. Trust is, is earned uh, and in a moment can be taken away. And I, and I hope that everybody has the patience to get, get to know uh, Theodora. She is, she's got a good heart. And she's got a real thirst for knowledge and, and serving people. So I, I think she's going to do really well in this role. So please make sure you give her a warm welcome. Um, and because, again, those are big shoes to fill in that office. No pressure, Tidora. No pressure. <laughs> good. Good, good, good. Oh, you're with the sweetest people. Yep. <laughs> so... Um, I really just think I'm, I'm going to end on, on that uh, real highlight. This was a, a jam-packed call. Uh, we recorded it. So, yeah, Greg's point is like, hey, there's some really good things we need to implement into some of our, our clauses there in, in our templates. Absolutely. And, and it's ever-changing, too, right? So let's do that. Um, Christina and I will kind of circle back and, and kind of go over what we need to um, update there. <laughs> but I, I think I got it all. Were there any questions? This was a, this wasn't a very interactive <laughs> session. Uh, oh, look at that! The hug. <laughs> oh, it's happening. <laughs> uh, Tony's to, Tony's giving the hug of approval, guys. That's a big deal. <laughs> no, that's wonderful. <laughs> are, are there any questions? Uh, any comments that uh, any of you have here? No. I said it all. I know. You did. A lot of congratulations. That was a big meeting, Trevor. <laughs> we all I have something to say. Hey, Trevor, I got one thing. Oh, yeah, Seth, your, your phone is, oh, there we go. So I created the, anyone who's on an iOS um, who wants to personalize their phone. That's uh, ooh, so cool. You can really customize it now. And I can put in the wallpaper that I created into the group Facebook and people can play around with it. But, you know, when you want to do that kind of professional, you know, looking phone, if you're in a meeting, just a thought. I like that. That's sharp. <clears throat> Better than a, a selfie of, of, of my good hair day. I get it. Yeah. Uh, I'll take that under consideration. Yeah. Linda, yes. I just... Uh... Because I can't leave without saying anything, obviously. Uh, I just wanted to welcome Teodora. I think that's awesome news, and I can't wait to uh, to sit and chat and um, catch up. So welcome, Teodora. Thank you. We're gonna have fun. Thank you. Very good. Well, guys, look, it's one o'clock. Um, I can't wait to start packing and get on that plane to go to Newfoundland. I'm looking forward. For those who are not going to Newfoundland, don't worry. We're gonna take lots of. Uh, incriminating photos and videos, and we're going to post it live as it's all <laughs> happening. So make sure you guys are paying attention. If you need to uh, warn anybody, you're live, Trevor. Okay, got turn it off. Um, but we're going to have a great time. We will uh, bring back lots of pics and stories, I'm sure, for October 4th meeting. Um, so that's, uh, but this is these sorts of events. I, it's been three years since we've done it. We need this camaraderie with not just one another, uh, but with the uh, brand across across the nation. It's a big company, and we we take a lot away from these events. So I'm uh, looking forward to that. Joanne, any closing remarks? 
Um, I think I, oh, no, I do still have my audio. No, I'm just, it was a great meeting, lots of really valuable content and exciting to uh, welcome Theodora in her new role in leadership in the company. And, you know, again, just a great group of people in our Orangeville office that I know she'll take really good care of. And it, it is time for us to be out and about with one another. I'm so excited. And, and you know, guys, look, it, it's, we're number 18 halfway through the year globally. Uh, I, this is remarkable. You, you are a remarkable group of people. And I could not be more proud. And let me tell you, thank you, that I will be marching across the stage. I do have my tiara. I have my sash. Uh, for being um, Miss Teen Newfoundland. I'll be up on stage accepting number 18 in the world on behalf of everyone and uh, partying on through George Street. So we're going to have a wonderful time and can't wait to see you all and hug you all in Newfoundland. It'll be all ready for you, all ready and warmed up. Awesome. Have a great week, everybody. Bye. See you soon. Have a great bye -bye. week. We'll chat next bye -bye. week. Bye now. Bye-bye.